Hi. A lot of people here tonight. This is good. Nice big school. Um, we're going to learn about winterizing tonight. So real quick, I'm going to introduce my supporting team. Dave Hubaka, a lot of you know him through sales. Michael Freeze takes care of the technical side of it for us. Aaron, he works in our parts department. And we have Kyle also over in the parts department. So, all right, without further ado, we're going to learn how to winterize. All right, so what is winterizing? Who knows? What are we trying to accomplish when we winterize? Okay, that's why we do it. But what is the actual, what are we actually doing when we winterize? That, that's close. Replace the water. We're displacing the water. We're, we're flushing the water out of the system. So, and we're doing that by pushing antifreeze in where the water was. Why do we use antifreeze? Doesn't freeze, right? <laughs> Common sense. So, it's a basic diagram of what it is to winterize. So, we start at the pump. We suck it out of a gallon of antifreeze. Some people like to pour it in their tanks. I don't like doing that, but that's your thing. And if you want to do it, it's okay. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, but your tank will turn pink, and you will never, you will use more. If you put that in your fresh water tank, you will use probably at least five gallons of antifreeze to do it versus two gallons if you pump it straight at the pump. So anyway, so what do we do? We pump it into the pump, and then it's pushed through out to your various spots, faucets, uh, so on and so forth. So why do we need to winterize? Well, you look at some of the costs of some of that stuff there, that's a pretty good indication. Any of you got a big motor home with a aqua hot system in it? $13,000. That was the last one I did. That's the coil out of the inside of a boiler tube right there in the bottom, that thing right there. That's what the inside of an aqua hot looks like. Just a bunch of copper tubes wrapped around a boiler box sitting in a suspension of boiler antifreeze. So, yeah, $13,000 is what that costs. Water heater tank replacement, upper right-hand corner. This is what happens if you don't drain the water heater tank. That water freezes, and it'll split that thing right open. So that's a five to $1,200 fix. Just a kitchen faucet, 50 to $200. So, and water lines themselves throughout could be $100 to who knows, depending on what breaks. So, yeah, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we do our winterizing. And when you think about the cost of winterizing, it's about the price of a pair of Nike shoes nowadays, you know, is all it costs to get it winterized. You know, you're almost a fool if you don't do it. So, winterizing 101. These are just some of the items that you might need when you go to start winterizing. So, the hose, I got hoses attached to the two types of pumps here. On the shore flow, we just use a screw on half inch fitting. If you have a flow jet pump, uh, passports mainly, uh, Keystone products, uh, we'll use the snap in hose. So you have to have the special adapter at the end of it. So um, sometimes you need to have a half inch adapter um, to screw on to one of these. If you've got a stub out, a lot of them have a stub out. Um, I'll show a picture of that as we get into this and explain that a little bit more. Um, slip joint pliers, that way you can take the fittings apart where you need to. Um, drill with a number two square bit, access compartments. The pump is always stuck behind something. So you always have to pull a panel or something off. And most of the time they use square bits in these things, as you know. Uh, flashlight, so you can see in the dark there in those compartments. Um, Two gallons of antifreeze. The average camper will not need more than two gallons of antifreeze. Now, you start getting to the bigger buses and stuff like that, 
you might need three or four depending on the devices and stuff that are also in it. But generally speaking, for for an average camper, these things, the one outside the door, uh, you know, small C classes and even small A's shouldn't need more than two. Um, what else we got up there? You need to make sure that your 12 volt battery is good. Um, that way you can run the pump. And uh, for your water heaters, you're going to have either a suburban water heater is going to have a one and one sixteenth. That's the one in the middle with the anode rod that you have to take out. And then your uh, your Atwoods will have the uh, seven eighths or fifteen sixteenths. I like to have a uh, a socket with a three inch extension. That way I can just wedge it right up underneath the gas valve on an Atwood and get to that valve. The Atwoods or the uh, Suburbans are really easy to get to because they're right there in the bottom in the middle. When liquid water is cooled, it contracts to approximately a temperature of 39 degrees. After that, it expands until it reaches the freezing point. At the freezing point, it expands by approximately 9%. That's water. That's why it breaks things. Propylene glycol, RV antifreeze, is designed to provide burst protection to minus 50. There's also minus 100s out there. Pretty much everything we use here is minus 50, though. We're, uh, we're in a climate where if it gets down to minus 50, we're probably in trouble. So ice crystals will start to form in minus 50 antifreeze around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. At minus 10, it will appear to be solid. It's not, it's slushy, but it's not solid. And it will continue that way and contract, not expand, until it reaches minus 50. Like I said, if we get to minus 50, we're gonna be in trouble. So, one of the questions that uh, early on was about the differences between automotive antifreeze and RV antifreeze. So, First of all, what does antifreeze do? Protects from freezing. In an automobile, ethylene glycol, which is the antifreeze they use, is used in the closed loop system and the internal combustion. It is toxic. Its function is to prevent engine coolant from freezing in cold weather and to aid in the transfer of heat during warm weather. Its color is green, or it can be yellow or orange, depending on what model car you have and what brand it is and stuff. Um, RV antifreeze. There's three main formulations. There's ethyl alcohol based. There's propylene glycol, and then there's a blend. Um, the ethanol is the lowest cost. It is flammable. And it also can cause seals to dry out in plumbing systems. And it is safe for use in all portable water systems. Propylene glycol is a higher cost, and it's pure. Um, doesn't contain alcohol, which will not harm seals. Um, usually we see this used primarily as boiler antifreeze, the pure uh, propylene glycol. And that's also what they use in the aqua hot systems if you have the aqua hot in your, in your vehicle. Um, and again, it's safe for use in portable water systems. Propylene ethical, ethanol blend, blend, that's what we use here. It's a little bit uh, less in cost than the uh, pure propylene glycol. does contain alcohol. It is not in a content that, or a uh, content that is high enough considered for damage to seals. Um, but you have to know, yes, it does have alcohol in it. Um, and its color is normally red or pink. Water pumps, I got uh, two examples of the actual water pumps up here. This one's the SureFlow. It has the half inch threaded fittings on it. And then the Flow Jets, you can usually tell them because they got the white housing up here. They have the push in fittings that have to be clipped on using the, the little blue clips. I'm going to leave these. They're a little heavy, so I'm not going to pass them around. Um, but if you want to come up and look at them later, feel free. Um, you always want to make sure that you hook up on the inlet side when you're hooking up. All of these pumps have an arrow through them. 
that shows which way the water flows through. So you want to make sure that you do hook up on the, on the inlet side. As you're looking at the front of it, it's obviously the left side is always the intake. And that's going to be universal throughout all of the, the pumps. Um, these are just different types of, of hookups. Um, the top one up here is actually pumping through the city water valve. By turning a valve here, you can actually hook up your hose right there We're using a garden hose or something type fitting, and uh, it will suck it in using the pump. Um, down here, these are, these are stand pipes um, or stub out fittings. Um, that's what I was talking about a while ago when I was when I mentioned that. On this one, you've got the hookup. Your winterizing, darn it, your winterizing line is actually going to hook up right here to this fitting. So you're going to take this plug out. You're going to hook your winterizing line up there, but you got to have the the little half inch adapter. Um, and then you got a valve right here that you need to make sure you shut off. That way, it keeps water from being able to be pumped out of the freshwater tank when you turn on and start winterizing. Um, this is just a different view of the same thing. So, um, Water pumps, they're always hidden under something. That On that trailer, it just happens to be under all that. Water heater bypasses. There's three main types of bypass. This is probably the most important thing that people will miss when they do their own winterize. So, as you can see on this one, there's three valves, okay? You have to turn all three of them valves to the opposite position they are. So this one right now is in a used position. So you can see that the top and bottom on the cold and hot water lines here and here are parallel with the lines and the bypass is actually perpendicular. So to put this in bypass, you would turn this one up and down, this one up and down, and then this one parallel with the lines being up and down also. And that would actually bypass. What, what's the purpose of bypassing it? Right, right. You don't pump, you don't pump antifreeze into the tank. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's like this guy said, six, you know, pumping six gallons of antifreeze in a tank. So anyway, the other, two, the other two systems, this is a single valve, so it's doing everything right at the valve right here. So you just turn the handle to the point where it says winterize. And then on a two-valve system, the winterizing line is connected at each valve. So all you're doing is changing the handle position, and then it flows through the cold up into the hot and then back out. Who wants to watch a video? Okay, welcome to this year's winterizing video. Today I have chosen to do a C-Class motorhome. It's a fairly simple one, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. So the number one question I get when we start to winterize is always, where is my water pump located? So what I recommend is going to your main panel where your water pump switch is, just turn it on. Then just listen for the sound of the water pump operating. In this case, we're right here in this cabinet. All right, so speed up the process for our video. I've already moved our access cover, and I've already got my winterizing line attached, and I've also switched the cutoff valve for the fresh tank input. So we're going to go ahead and hook our first gallon of antifreeze up and turn the water pump back on. Once we turn the faucet on, we get the antifreeze sucking into the system. We're just waiting for the paint. This unit has a shower only, so all we're going to do here is just turn on the water at the faucet, let it run till we get pink. There we're flowing pink on that side. Now we'll switch to the other side. We want to make sure that we're actually getting pink, so we're going to wait a minute, let it run. See it going pink.
I'm going to do the toilet. Same thing. We wait until we see the paint coming. And there we go. Now we're running a good stream of paint. So that's the toilet. We've emptied our first bottle of antifreeze. So the little bit that's left in it, we're just going to pour it down a drain. That way we make sure our pee traps are properly winterized. So the last item in the bathroom is the bathroom sink. So we'll just turn it on again. Wait till we got a good stream of paint. Switch over to the other faucet. Make sure we got a good stream of paint. And that takes care of all the faucets on the inside. All right, so on the outside, we got the outside shower. So we're gonna do the same thing like we've been doing on the inside. It's a little harder to see the pink out here, but you can pretty much see it on the ground. So we'll run both sides. Make sure we got pink coming out. And then we're good there. You'll notice that I haven't said anything about the water heater in this thing yet because we have a tankless water heater in here. So there's nothing to do other than just run water through the system. It goes through the lines in the water heater as it's flowing through and going out to the faucets. So there's no valves or anything else to change on this particular water heater. And it's already winterized now. Final step is to do the city water. To do that, you have to pop the little screen out of it. Then you reach in. And there's a little button on the inside here. If you got to put any force at all on it to push that open, you got too much pressure on the back side still and you'll blow the little O-ring that's in here off. It should just take a light press. And it'll bleed water out. And you do that until you get pink. You may have to do it a couple of times before you get it to the point where it's, it's actually blowing pink out of it. So after we get our city water done, then we're going to come back inside and we're ready to start wrapping it up. So the first thing that I do is I just drain my line out of the antifreeze. I flip the pump on for a second. Then it sucks the rest of the antifreeze out of my hose. Then what we have left of the antifreeze, we're going to just dump down available drains. So we'll go in the bathroom, dump it down the drains on both the the shower and the sink. We've taken and dumped the rest of our antifreeze down the drains now, so our final thing is to, we want to make sure that we wipe up the antifreeze that's set and loose and things, because it will stain, that pink will stain, and then we can remove our our hose and button everything back up. Okay, and we're done. A couple of things I didn't address in that was uh, refrigerators, either home type or RV type, uh, clothes washers or dishwashers. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about those items now. Um, RV refrigerators, they're the easiest thing out there as far as winterizing goes when it comes to a refrigerator with an ice maker. All it has is a simple little valve. It's going to look like that from the side. It's going to look like that on top, just two pins. If you have an old extension cord or old cord of some kind, power cord for, you know, whatever, um, you can cut the end of it off. This right here, you can cut the end of it off and put a couple of quick female terminals, quick disconnect female terminals on there. They will go right on these tabs. All you have to do then is have some power to the plug for the refrigerator and plug that cord in with it hooked up to the valve. Let it run for about five seconds after you've winterized everything else in the RV and your ice maker valve and ice maker are winterized. The only thing we care about in winterizing an ice maker, and I don't care what it is, I don't care if it's a household refrigerator or an RV refrigerator, when I am winterizing an ice maker, the only thing I care about is that thing right there. The ice maker doesn't care whether it's winterized. It has room for the ice to expand and there's nothing holding it in. Those are 120 volt, that is correct. So, I say it again. 
The only thing, when I went to rise an ice maker, the only thing I care about is that valve. That's the only thing that's important. Now, if you have, there's very few RV refrigerators that have drinking water dispensers, but there are a couple out there. Household refrigerators, you're more likely to have a drinking water dispenser. All of the drinking water dispenser units have a cooling tank inside the refrigerator that holds water. The only way to winterize that is to pump antifreeze through the water dispenser until you've got either pink or you've got the greasy kind of feel of antifreeze coming out. A lot of them you can't take the, just a second, I'll get to you. Um, a lot of them you cannot take the filters out of, especially households, you cannot take the filters out of many of these. So the filter will take the color out of the antifreeze. So the only way you know is either you got to smell it or you got to feel it. The, once the antifreeze starts coming through, it'll kind of get greasy and you won't have that, that just that plain water feel to it. You kind of have a greasy feel to it. But usually you smell it for, for anything else. It doesn't take the smell out. It just takes the color out. So is everybody with me on winterizing refrigerators? So the, my recommendation for winter guys, especially a household, let it run. Winterize the whole vehicle. Then let the thing run. If you've got water in the door, a water dispenser, make sure you pump antifreeze through it. And it may take, you may have to spend three or four more gallons, depending on how big that reservoir is, in addition to what you've used to do the rest of the coach. So if you've got like an Allegro bus or something like that to where you got a dishwasher, washer dryer, you got household refrigerator, plus the rest of the coach, you know, bath and a half sometimes, you know, you may figure six to seven gallons to winterize one of those units. But you're doing it basically the same way. You're just sucking it through the pump and up throughout all the devices. So anyway, household refrigerators, the easiest way to do it Winterize the vehicle, let it run, 24 hours. Just leave it on, leave it plugged in, and then let it run. Let's move on. So washing machines and dishwashers. Um, basically, both of these are pretty much the same thing. Um, with the washing machine, the clothes washer, all you're going to do is you're going to pick a warm water cycle. Once you've winterized everything else in the coach, make sure that you have a full gallon of antifreeze hooked up to the system. Start the washer, like I said, in a warm water cycle. Let it go until you start to see water or antifreeze, either one, coming up here in this basket. And it's at the bottom of the basket inside the door. Once you see liquid coming up in there, stop the washer, shut it down completely, put it into a drain cycle. Some of there, depending on a washer you have, they're all going to be a little bit different, but put it into a drain cycle, restart it. First thing it's going to do is it's going to pump that liquid right out of there. So you've now winterized both your hot and cold water valves and your drain pump. It takes about five minutes to do it. Very simple. Dishwasher, for those of you that might have one. I got a picture of a dish drawer here that would be in a Phaeton or a bus, uh, but it's going to be the same thing if you got a Volano. They use the stand-up uh, household type apartment uh, dishwashers, but it's the same thing. Start a cycle. Wait till it runs for a few seconds. Again, make sure that you start out with a fresh gallon of antifreeze. That way you know you got enough. You're not going to run out while it's doing it. Um, just let it run for. 30 seconds or so, so you actually hear that it's running water into it. You'll hear the pump cycling as it's running water into it. Stop it. Open the drawer up. Most of them, when you close them back up, the first thing they do is go into a pump cycle. After it goes through the pump cycle, you've now winterized the water valve in it, and you've winterized the pump. It's just that simple. And then you can shut the whole system down. You're done. These are the last two things I will do when I winterize a unit, if I have these. So. All right. Everybody with me there? 
guess what? We're done.